Um, so I, I started thinking about things and started thinking about the whole kind of past year in media, and there were these really, uh, kind of, it was kind of a wild ride for feminists and womenists to kind of negotiate and like figure out what our place was and respond to things and, and to take charge and stuff. So some of the things that came to mind for me was, you know, Julia, Julian Assange re re reveals not just his own douchebaggery, but the pervasive douchebaggery of patriarchy everywhere, <laughs> especially in homegrown U.S. progressivism. My goodness. That was quite a period there from December to uh, maybe like mid-February, right? That was just kind of a giant hot mess. And then on the upside, he had uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya. Women played such a huge role in those uprisings through their own work in media, through their own blogging, through their uh, tweeting and participation, through their organizing skills. Women's roles there were just outstanding. Um, and then, you know, you go back to the U.S. and you have, like, our entire list of kind of legislative insanity over the past year, Prop 8 madness, Wisconsin, H.R. 3, you know, hey, let's do the double whammy of redefining rape and limiting access to abortion. Awesome. Good job, Republicans. Um, there, remember that, there was also, this was one of my favorite tweets last year. Um, do you remember that one week that, like, Don't Ask, Don't Tell started to get um, taken apart, um, but then, like, Rescue workers from 9/11 were denied health care, but then like these billionaires got these this crazy like tax and, like this all happened legislatively in one week. And there was this guy, uh, Paul Good, I think is his, how you say his last name, but he tweeted um, for the terminally ill gay billionaire fireman who had hoped to serve openly for two years to gain citizenship. This week was kind of a wash. <laughs> it's like, and so it was like, it, it, it just couldn't like comprehend that entire week. Because it was all the Dream Act went down and blame, and it was just, yeah, it was crazy. So, so you had all that stuff happening, but then you also had these kind of smaller wins, these little bits of culture change that didn't necessarily get, you know, crazy uh, amounts of attention outside of certain circles. But nonetheless, they made people's lives a little different, maybe even a little better, dare I say, a little easier. One of those moments came for me for, through a campaign that I worked on in December that actually a lot of you in this room had a hand in supporting. Um, it was uh, some work that I was hired to do for Exhale, which is a no uh, national nonprofit organization which provides the first and only non-judgmental, national, multilingual, after-abortion talk line. That's a mouthful to say every time. But um, so, who uh, who is from, is anybody familiar with Exhale? That you know, oh yeah, great, cool, awesome. Um, so the the story there was that Exhale had the opportunity to partner with MTV on an abortion special, national abortion special. It would seem that after a couple of years of Teen Mom and 16 and Pregnant, MTV goes hmm, you know, 37 percent of teen pregnancies end in abortion. Maybe we should talk about this. So they called Exhale, and they were first looking um, to Exhale to provide women who might be interested in going on the show, but then Exhale ended up with the opportunity to actually help shape how the topic was presented to viewers. And so what we wanted to do online, I was hired to help create a, a social media campaign um, to, to talk about this, is we wanted to actually create a space where people could tell the women that were uh, participating on that show, and then by extension, all women who had chosen to have abortions, that they are loved. That was the bottom line. Exhale calls this movement pro-voice, and I learned something very powerful through their pro-voice work. One of the main things is that they figured out that very um, that, that political rhetoric of all kinds, whether you're pro-choice or anti-choice, uh, has the potential to really shut down women who are seeking out emotional uh, resonance or support in, in their after-abortion lives. And, But when you give women a, a rhetoric-free space to speak, they're able to tap into a level of support for women that is really, really rare. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this before, and it manifests in, in, in extreme and profound ways. So they wanted to extend that work that they're already doing further with this campaign, and so we created this, this, uh, this whole series of stuff called 16 and Loved, which was the basis of this website. And there's a full case study that you can read on my website. Um, actually, I'm going to post these notes um, that I'm reading from and referring to here on my website with hyperlinks and stuff, so um, that'll have all kinds of uh, stuff later for you. And there's gonna hopefully be this, this video posted. Um, so the gist of it was though that was we created a website where people could share messages of love for the women involved in that show, or any woman who had had an abortion, and that any kind of political message, pro or against, wouldn't be allowed. And this is what we told people. 
Let's make sure that these brave young women feel our unconditional love and support. Consider these questions and then share your words of inspiration. Knowing that these women are sharing a very personal experience in a very public way, what do you want to validate and affirm? What will you do to show your love for a woman in your life who has had an abortion? Submissions, on comment, submissions and comments on posts will be moderated. Only messages of love and support will be approved. No politics, blaming, judging, shaming, or name calling. This is a place for women to support women who have had an abortion speaking from our own experience. This is not a place to try to influence others' beliefs, values, or actions. We got several hundred messages in total. Only about three to five of them were kind of crazy anti-choice people telling us that we were killing babies. That was awesome. Uh, many of the submissions, though, that, um, on the positive side, actually did have kind of a lot of messages of pro-choice advocacy. And we wrote back to their authors and we asked them to reconsider their language. And many of them did, and then resubmitted. So I could sit here and rattle off a whole bunch of numbers. Those are actually in the case study. But um, you know, I could talk about how many hits we got on the website or how many mentions were on Twitter that our Facebook page exploded. All of those things were, were great and true, but actually the numbers don't mean anything to me. They really don't. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in depth why later, but the things that really mattered in the end were messages like this one from Tanel. She wrote in and said, today I found these videos on MTV and at first I didn't even know what to think. I had an abortion myself at 16 and for just over two years, I've tried to hide the pain that came along with my decision. I was in a physically and emotionally abusive relationship with a boy who was unfaithful and not there for me. If not for my family, I would not be here today. I did not want to have an abortion, but I was out of school at the time and I knew that down the road it would be the right decision. I went through with it and tried so hard to hide it from my life. Over the two years that followed, I was very sad and ashamed of what I did. Watching these videos makes me remember what I have been through and how strong I am today. Thank you for these videos. It feels good to know that I am not alone and will never be. My mom and I have never been closer and I graduated from high school on time and now I'm living for me with my current boyfriend who is my best friend. He supports me, he supports what I have to do and wouldn't change me for anything and after watching these videos, I know I wouldn't change anything either. I think about what I had to go through every day, but I know I made the right decision for me at the time. Thank you for reminding me that I am not a bad person and that I am not alone. Thank you. This is another one from Stephanie. I watched the show last night and I have to say I'm so amazed and inspired by these girls for being able to not feel ashamed or embarrassed of their choice. I watched crying, wishing I had someone to really talk to about my abortion. I have not even been able to tell my own mother. It has been several years, yet I still feel the weight of the choice that I made. Although I know it was the best choice for me and my daughter that I did have at the time, there is such a stigma attached, and even though it was just a bunch of cells at the time, I still felt much like Mark Hyde, who is one of the women on the show. It was still part of me, and no one else would understand except the mother who had to endure it. So thanks for your voice. I know, I'm, I know now I am not alone in my feelings and that a little bit of my shame is gone. Think about that, a little bit of my shame is gone. There are hundreds more on the site like these. So tell me, do we really care what the metrics are? Or are you like me, overwhelmed with the sense that we made some women's lives a little tiny bit better? And how did we do that? We started with stories. We told our stories. We listened to other women telling their stories and then we told some more. Back in the day, all you second waivers out there, in there, you know, uh, they used to do this thing called consciousness raising. It was brought up earlier. Uh, you know, where, where women sat around in circles and told stories. And, and not that, that that consciousness raising stuff was not without problems. You know, it often marginalized uh, the voices of queer women and women of color. Um, but one thing, um, despite those complications, a singular message started to form. I am not alone. This is systemic. I am not crazy. On a side note, by the way, on the I'm not crazy note, I've been known to call the WAM listserv the Dear Lord, I'm not crazy list. Um, yeah. It has been around for long before social media really went mainstream, and it has been a place for me for many, many years that I can go, oh, God, I'm not alone. Oh, God, I'm not crazy. Oh, thank you for saying that. Um, it's, there, there's some sort of thread that we form when we share our outrage and our triumphs. And when we participate in these kind of authentic activities, when we share with one another, we do more than just get the word out about the things that we care about. 
We reject, we reject prescribed identities, and we say this is what it's like to be a person in these shoes. We beat down the doors of the powerful and demand to be heard in new ways. We find each other and we say either overtly or covertly, you are not alone. Many of you have heard me say this before, but I think it bears repeating. The main product of all this sharing is that we create empathy. Empathy is the opposite of apathy. It's not just when we recognize that other people have feelings or that bad things happen in the world, but when we actually share in the emotions of the people around us. Studies have shown that when we're participating in social networks, for example, oxytocin is released in our brain, and that's the hormone that's responsible for feelings of affection and kind of cuddling and bonding. Digital interactions can, can foster, can release that. There's another really cool kind of nerdy psych, uh, 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 science thing that happens in our brains with empathy, too, that I want to tell you about. Um, you know the TED Talks? Everybody knows mm -hmm. TED, right? Cool, TED.com. Um, if you go there, look up a talk. If you look for mirror neurons, mirror, like looking in a mirror and then neurons like your brain, um, there's this amazing seven minute talk that I can't recommend enough. It's so freaking cool. But the guy talks about how there are subsets of neurons in our brains that when we see people doing certain uh, activities, our brains actually try to place ourselves in that person's <laughs> shoes and start firing as if we were experiencing it. That means what? Our brains are hardwired for empathy. We are wired to be this way. We are not just Darwinian, dog eat dog, every person for themselves. We are wired to empathize with one another. Our stories can activate that hard wiring and the trust that we create with one another on social networks is what fuels that kind of empathetic response that we have to, um, to one another, even if we don't know each other that well. And it's that trust created empathy to me that's that what, what will lead us um, out of the isolation and the apathy. So much of our last century's focus has been on market demographics and you know, siloing people and separating them into these little groups. And social technologies are called social for a reason. They're about connecting and sharing and engaging. Your presence is required in this work. We need you here. But change doesn't happen on its own. It, it requires you to show up and for you to participate. One of the biggest things that I say when I'm working with folks is that Technology will not solve our problems. We will solve our problems, and we can use technology to do that. If you choose to sit this one out, bad idea, there's a ripple effect that's caused by your absence because you're not in there in these giant public conversations that we're having about the things that we, about policy, about art and culture, about all of these things that we care about. Those conversations will go on without you, and other people will be making decisions and shaping those conversations without the benefit of your experience. And that's kind of already what's been happening for the last several thousand years for most of us, and I'm not very interested in continuing that, and I suspect that you aren't either. So the good news is, is that so far, so good. We're starting to take these necessary steps to infuse those, those public conversations and dialogue with what matters to us. Make no mistake, though, there are clearly people who are threatened by this. When you hear stories about the death of the media and the death of privacy and the death of lots of things, what you are hearing are people who are lamenting the loss of control and power. I don't want to take away from journalists in the room who are struggling to make a living. I understand that this is an extremely painful moment that we are living through that we haven't figured out yet. But I'm talking about on a more macro level. I, I remembered uh, last night a... Um, I, just, I love the sound, the sound of the baby, by the way. It's the best backdrop ever. Um, uh, there was an episode of, you know, on the media, on NPR. Um, uh, last summer, they interviewed this guy, Yochai Benkler. Anybody know him? He wrote this really dense, really dense, but really, really fabulous book called The Wealth of Networks, and it talks about a lot of the stuff about how social networks work. Um, and Brooke Gladstone was asking him about the concept of the, of the lost public square with the decline of mainstream media, there is no public square anymore. And his answer I thought was just brilliant. He actually said to her, what are we lamenting? Are we lamenting the decline of a shared culture that's relatively dominated by a small number of people who can decide <laughs> what everyone needs to know? That's obviously not a state that we have to yearn for. 
What happens when many people, especially women of many races, many classes, sexualities, and identities, decide and start deciding what everyone needs to know? Of course, you have the cacophony. You have just a, a myriad of stuff <coughs> happening. But you know, we're working on the filters for that, both technologically and human. We're learning to kind of filter some of that out. But besides that cacophony, you get these shining moments of storytelling, pushing through the noise and reaching people who need to be reached. There were two more campaigns, both of which have kind of been discussed today a little bit already that I wanted to um, kind of bring up here. But both of them made me really step back and marvel at the resilience and the resourcefulness of women coming together online. The first one was More and Me, right? Remember More and Me? We've already talked about this a little bit. Um, so just the, the little recap, like me, Michael Moore is sort of this like lovable lefty rabble rouser, and then he had to like go and be a dumbass, you know? It's just like, <laughs> really? Did you? I'm sorry. Like I seriously didn't think I would stop twitching like this for like days. I was just like, uh, is this ever gonna end? Because I'm just I'm freaking out here. So. Um, the thing that was also sort of stunning to me about that is when this sort of progressive leftosphere didn't really call them out on that. They, like, they're just like, oh, whatever. They're just going along about their business. So Sadie Doyle comes up from Tiger Beat Down and says, I'm not going to put up with this. I'm going to create a hashtag. Who knows what a hashtag is? Pretty much everybody. It's, you know, it's when you got a keyword to a bunch of tweets so that you can figure out what the whole conversation is and follow everything that everybody's saying. Uh, Jacqueline Friedman jumped in, yay, ED of Wham, a big round of applause for Jacqueline, yay. 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 And we also had Kate Harding, vlogger extraordinaire, she was like pushing this stuff, you know, supporting uh, Sadie and kicking things into high gear to demand an apology from Michael Moore. So you had thousands of tweets of people telling stories of rape. What is real rape? Because we know in this room that all <laughs> rape is real rape. And we wanted those stories to be heard, and it blossomed. And even though Moore never really came out and apologized, he did that sort of mealy mouth interview thing with Rachel Maddow. But you know, I don't think that that interview would have happened without the Moore and Me campaign. But then we had Naomi Wolf. Uh, <laughs> oh, Naomi, sister, where did we go wrong? <laughs> she was like, it was. So she decided to school us all about what was real rape, or what Whoopi Goldberg called rape rape. But then thankfully, Jacqueline went on Democracy Now! and just like totally schooled her. And there was just, there was all this amazing conversation. And it was everywhere. And then other publications started picking it up and talking about it. Um, so let's think about this, like going back to you know campaign thinking strategically. Traditionally, what, what did that campaign accomplish? There were no laws passed. There were no apologies made. And, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Olbermann, sorry you were offended business. Like, whatever. Doesn't count. Totally doesn't count. Um, the, the whole case wasn't necessarily uh, affected by this conversation. So all the things that traditionally we might have required for to determine the success of a campaign actually didn't happen. But how many women felt a little less crazy when they saw all those tweets going by? How many people were like, oh yeah, I'm not alone, I'm not alone in my outrage. And like I said, I really doubt that that interview with Rachel Maddow would have happened without something as pervasive and, and ongoing and with such tenacity as, as the Mormon campaign went on. And also on the anecdotal side, I wanted to share this kind of crazy little success story that I had personally. And I don't think I'm the only person that has a story like this. So I was on vacation in February and I was at dinner with a whole group of people that I didn't know at all. And we're, sit we're all sitting around talking, and Assange comes up. And I can like see it coming at me, you know? And I'm just like, no! And I was like, I'm on vacation! Like, Please don't do this to me. And it was horrible. Like, ev like, imagine every bad talking point that you heard being brought up at this dinner. And I'm just sitting there like, Waiter, drink, please. Yes. <laughs> Several shots of tequila. Right? You know, and like, I just couldn't believe what was happening. And it, it, it just, it was, it was really stunning. And so, um, you know, I was like, okay, here we go. And I just, you know, I started in with my talking points. Consent is not a light switch. All rape is, is rape. You know, just going right down the line. And, and the bizarre thing was, is that by the end of that conversation, the tone had entirely changed. One, people started agreeing with me. Or they were looking at me with that, you know, like, huh, oh, 
look, you know, oh, I never, never thought about that, never thought about that, yeah. huh. you know, and I was like, okay, this is cool, and then there was this French guy, he's sitting next to me, which this whole thing sounds much better with a French accent that I'll spare you because I'm not very good at it, but he turned to me and he said, you know, I never thought about rape and consent that way. Thank you for explaining it to me. I, I see it completely different now, and I, re I totally agree with you. I totally get it now. And I know that I wouldn't have been able to hold my ground like that had my Twitter feed not been completely bombed with talking points for weeks and weeks and weeks beforehand. So huge success. So, oh, and you know, I just had to tell this other story too. It wouldn't be a good campaign if we couldn't find a little humor in all this. Like, it's hard to find humor and like, you know, rape bad, you know, but humor. Um, so, Naomi Wolf went on the BBC radio when I can remember is when she went on the radio and we were all just like, on Twitter, we were all just like, I, I can't believe what she's, you know. So I was like, you know what we should do? We should make a, a a bullshit bingo card with like all the messed up stuff that she's saying. So we did, we made this bingo card and you can still download it at my website, the link will be on the notes later. Um, and so we had squares that said things like dating police and if you followed my work and <laughs> reporting you've been raped has serious consequences. <gasps> no, really, <laughs> you know? And my favorite, um, which was, wait, what's cisgender? You know, like really, you're a feminist and she's so bonus shock, who rem okay, we had the free space um, was 23. Who knows why we had 23 as the free space in the center? Does anyone remember? I actually had to ask Jacqueline last night. Why, I was like, why did we do this? The answer was, that's the number of years that um, Naomi Wolf claims to have been working with rape survivors. So as proof of cred that that's why she's right. Anyway, there was another recent campaign. There was the Dear John campaign. Uh, I feel like right now I'm kind of doing like the roast of 2011's batshit anti-woman moments, but you know, whatever, let's roll. Uh, John Boehner introduces legislation to the House that would, like I said, double whammy, redefine rape and eliminate funding for abortion. Just like, wow, we live in a bizarro world. But this is actually happening, and this is happening in places like South Dakota already. So response that could have been created in any number of ways. You could have done email campaigns, hello, move on. You could have done petitions. You could have done a bunch of things. Let's say you came back with another hashtag. Amanda jumped in. And what's interesting about that, we do have a tangible success there. The rape language was removed from the bill. And even though the bill is still going through the House, that language is no longer part of it. So the common thread in all of these stories was what? Women being mad as hell and not taking it anymore, and then telling their stories. Bringing themselves together to create fluid ad hoc movements that can be assembled and disassembled <coughs> at will to support and reinforce and cross-pollinate. Underneath all of that is a little bit of magic that's part authenticity, that's part audacity, it's part tactical, and it's part tenacity. Any of those things were missing, we would have failed in our mission to make someone else feel a little bit better, a little bit less alone in the world. Lest you think I'm preaching to the choir, which by the way, I'm a big fan of preaching to the choir. Like, yeah. I think we have a pretty fabulous effing choir. Right? <laughs> like, come on, you know? So yeah, so it's important to note though, really, according to a Pew study, people who participate on social networks have discussion circles that are 20% more diverse than people who do not. Twitter users are more likely to be active in their offline community communities than people who aren't. Equity, more than just diversity, it doesn't automatically happen online. And in fact, sometimes uh, the reverse kind of regularly happens. But if we're conscious and intentioned about where we put ourselves and who we're talking to, we can bridge the gaps with our stories that might never have been crossed. I truly believe that. I know I'm this like crazy glass half full kind of girl, but I really, I have faith in all of you to do the right thing. So the big question, what do you need to know going forward? In case it isn't obvious at this point, your stories matter. You need to be telling them. How you choose to do that is up to you, but let me offer you a little bit of advice. First thing is that leadership is drastically changing and it's for the better. Le leaders are no longer necessary figureheads to represent movements and that are ultimately co-opted. My friend Mika Sifri said it best on Twitter when he was referring to the Egyptian revolution. He said, there is no such thing as a leaderless movement. Today's leaders are network weavers, not charismatic figureheads. 
your job as a leader, because if you're here, if you're here learning, that's it, boom, you're a leader, I'm sorry, done, each one of you, blessed, automatically, you're now a leader. <laughs> Your job is not to be out front. Your job is to piece together data and stories and people to build your movement. This is what network weaving is, and this is where our future lies. And if you want to learn more about network weaving, there, there are two people um, who I'll link to with the, the notes, but their names are uh, June Holly and Valdis Krebs, who have done this incredible, incredible uh, work on network weaving and social networks. Network weaving becomes critical in non-tangible ways. I was moderating a panel about influence at South by Southwest a couple of weeks ago with some pretty fabulous ladies, by the way. There was Tawana Hines, funky brown chick. Yay. Yes, I know, right? Uh, Andrea Miller from your, uh, from your Tango, Cheryl Ponte from Jack Joe Politics, and Jean Russell from Thrivable. In any case, we got talking about numbers and reputation. And I told this story that I heard from these guys who wrote a book called Building Web Reputation Systems. And one of their conclusions from their 10 or so years of work in the field was basically that if you show people their karma, they totally abuse it. It's completely insane. They have this really amusing story about like these mafias being set up in the online version of The Sims, which like, I can tell you after, but it's really, really entertaining. But if you hide users' karma, they act like good social citizens. They act like people who don't know if they're going to heaven or not, so they're going to do their best to kind of be like a good person in the world. It's totally fascinating. So that just led to this discussion on Twitter about follower accounts, and, and I put it out there. What if we didn't know how many followers we had? What if we didn't know how many friends or fans we had? What if, what if when we tweeted something, it stopped after like three retweets and you were like, just Twitter was like, I don't know. I, just, I have no idea how many people retweeted this. You know? how, how would we measure success? How would we measure our popularity? So I put this question to the, the influence panel and the answer that Jean Russell came up with, um, she's a nurture girl on Twitter, highly recommend following her, very smart cookie. Um, she said, she gave this really interesting answer. She said, um, that how she measures how well she's doing and how compelling her work is, is by how often people want to introduce her to new people. If they're demanding it, if they're like, you've got to meet so-and-so, they're totally doing this stuff that overlaps with your work and it's awesome and you need to meet and talk and da 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 then she knows she's on the right track. And then when those things kind of dry up, she knows that she's missing something because her network isn't expanding. And it's not about collecting people, but it's about establishing and weaving those relationships. So I want you to do this from today going forward with all of this great stuff that you've had your eyes open to today, all of those thoughts that you've had reinforced, all that feeling of, dear Lord, I am not alone. I am, I am found my people and my tribe. I want your job to be from here on out to make sure that you are doing the work that excites you and therefore excites others into expanding your, your network and for you to be expanding the networks of others. It's not easy, it's not tangible, you can't always put your finger on it, but it's fun as hell and it's the dirty secret of the movement that's going to actually get us somewhere. So thank you.